How long have you lived in Byron for? Pretty much 10 years. Oh, yeah. Is it just the absolute life? It really is. Even after 10 years. Actually, it's so weird because I'm looking at you and you are a doppelganger of one of my best friends in Sydney. Really? Like, just actually, Jess? yes. How funny is that? That's it's so funny. so No uncanny. one ever tells me that I look like anyone. Like, Stephanie often, often gets like... Demi Moore, um, who Courtney, else do you get? Courtney, Courtney Cox. Cox. I'll send you a photo of her. Her name's Sasha and she's the most beautiful person. Oh, anyway, you look thank exactly you. Like How funny I will that? take that as a compliment then. <laughs> so you're in business with your sister, obviously, yes. Spelly, and we were just hearing that she's actually got a twin because we were going to ask you, you guys look a lot like twins and we yeah. obviously get mistaken for twins a lot. Yeah, well, there's four of us and we all look really similar. Um, I'm the oldest and then the twins are... 18 months younger than me and that's Spelly and her sister Luciana and Luce lives up here as well so she's oh, a hair makeup so artist nice. yeah so fun what what was growing up with four girls like was it like chaos it was just abundant like there was just I think now that I'm a parent and we're having children it's like I just want that abundance in the house where kids are running around and yeah yeah it's like a, a pot of bolognese you like make those massive grandma pots of bolognese for six people. That's how our family was. It was just yeah. so nice. everything was like a big lasagna and a big pot of macaroni cheese or whatever. So that's you're that's kind of like the Kardashians of Byron, <laughs> <laughs> oh God. the blonde uh, versions. Yeah, <laughs> and, and now are all your kids really close because you just had your third yeah. kid, right? Yeah, the, um, my kids are really close to Spelly's kids. They're really close in age. And then Luce has just had a little girl and I've got a little girl as well, which are, they're only like six months apart. So oh, that'll be close Oh, that's so well. nice. Yeah. We also have like a hundred first cousins and we all grew up in Melbourne together. And so like a family dinner, like on a Friday night is like at least 20 people. Yeah. And now that we all have partners and kids, it's like at least 45, like it's hectic. Yeah, it's, I can't imagine living in a small, quiet family. Like it's really nice being crazy and then how does it go like working with your sister as well because people love to ask us about that and do you fight and yeah. we don't yeah like people always ask us like tell us you must fight sometimes we're like why like we don't fight with anyone else why would we fight with each other totally and I think when you're little and you've got like a brother or a sister and you're seven you might like fight over something or like kick each other in the bed and jump on each other but when you get older you kind of move through that and you don't um Look, Spelly and I, we're, during our 20s and into our 30s, we were, su- were super close and working together was a dream and it still is, but we are in such different parts of the business now. Like she's down with design um, and she's got to go in there and focus on design and there's a whole world down there and then I'm up with business and marketing and sales and, and HR and we don't see all that much of each other, which is really sucks a little bit yeah we love to spend more time together and we have to really make an effort to come together and like okay let's get together and what are we talking you know how's it going and how are you feeling and do you feel like we're going in the right direction and then we're like we check in with each other oh. but um we're at different ends of the business you know and that works really well and that's probably why we were able to be you know I guess successful in those early days was that I handled one part of the business and the, those things that I handled, she didn't have huge strengths in. Yes. And then there was the design and the whole creative direction of the business. And she was really good at that. So we both just had different skill yeah. sets. We, We've, yeah. We, we so often hear people talk about that, that like, you know, in a partnership, like it's all great to start a business with your best friend. If you're, if you, you know, you both love fashion and you want to get into it. But if you both have the same skill set, it's going to be really hard. because And, and that's probably more likely when you're going to have little butt-ups. When you yeah. butt-up totally. against each other. Like, oh, you both want to post something on Instagram and, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, and you kind of like, oh. We kind of came at it from the opposite direction of like, when we started, we like did everything together. And like, what we like, we're in this startup program and I remember them saying like, no like you guys feel the exact same role in the business right now which is like you have your fingers in all the pies you really need to like divide and conquer and like we do have different skill sets but we just kind of love doing everything together and our email we still share an email address like we only <laughs> have one so email good. address yeah. between the e- two of us. every email so you both have the same inbox on different computers yeah and you sa- can see same, what same inbox, exactly same inbox. <laughs> now just recently we like uh, we started these new folders which is like jess action and steph action because it was getting a wow. bit too hectic but like every email comes from jess and steph and and like people are always like, why do you guys do that? It's so annoying. <laughs> but it's really? great for us because it's like Jess went to Byron, uh, sorry, to Bali for three weeks on a yoga teacher training course recently. I have followed 
Oh, oh, you've oh, heard all about it. On your podcast. Amazing. I'm, I'm in your podcast. I love so that you yeah. listen. <laughs> Amazing. I, know, I didn't know which one had been to the thing. I listened Just the yogi. Yeah. 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 Um, and like, she was just like, okay, see, our clock's off for three weeks and I take care of the emails, you know? So yeah. like, from yeah, that it was so handy. She just like had a folder for me and like at the end of every day, I'd like go in and just check if I needed anything. And I think that's what happens is as you mature as a business and as different things come into your life, like you might have something that happens or you go away or you have a child and there are uh, those are the moments where one of you will rise up and take charge of one particular part and that's yeah. what's happened with Spelly and I is that as we've had children and things have been happening in our lives whether it's a family holiday or whatever or school holidays and different things we've had to divide and conquer and yeah. she goes over there and I go over here and so it's good to know best. that you yeah. can rely on each yeah. other if you need to yeah. and I've been on maternity leave for almost a year and Spelly's just like stay on maternity leave it's fine just yeah. go off you know because she's yeah. been like had lots of family holidays and i've never had a family holiday really and so she's like you know take some time off you deserve it and yeah it, that's amazing really well. that's yeah. so special about being in business with family i guess is that like at the end of the day like you just recognize each other for like being human not being business owners and yeah. you're like i just want you to like be good and be enjoy happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so that- so we'd love to hear what life was like for you before Spell. Take us back to the beginning. Yeah. You so weren't living in Byron, were you? No, I was in Sydney. Um, I'm from Melbourne and I moved up to Sydney almost 20 years ago and then lived in Sydney for like seven years or something. But I was a film editor. So I was um, a freelancer and, yeah, a completely – different career nothing to do with fashion was never interested in fashion I loved dressing up and I was always very creative in the way I expressed myself through fashion but I wasn't a designer in any nothing to do with that um although I did start a blog called oh. Liz's looks.com oh, it's cool. still there if you look it's was Liz's, it on a blog spot it was Liz's look Liz no actually my flatmate started it called Liz's looks Lizza, because she calls me Lizza. Liz's looks.blogspot.com oh, how funny is that? every Our- time before I left the house she'd take a photo of me and this is like 20 years ago so no there were no like that is posts. so cool it. yeah. it's really is it daggy. still up there it's still there as far as i know unless blog spots died or something okay but we're pulling yeah. it out i think our blog spot is also up like our original yeah. oh my goodness it is up. Is it up? oh my god i am liz's flatmate and when she leaves the house looking this fine i'm compelled to take a picture and share it with the world yeah that is, that is so amazing funny. and that's me at the front door in bondi oh my every god, time i left and that? i'm not even like and when is that 2009 that is nuts how how cool. I love the way things like that on the internet just sit on there. Like we have the same thing with, I mean, it wasn't in 2009, it was 2011 or something, 2012. But like our old blog spot also still sits online and like maybe once every second year I remember that it's there and I'll yeah. go and have a look and just like get lost in the pages. Well, we started a podcast as well. So no. what? yeah, and it was called It's All About Us and it was just us talking about us. What? Where did you post it? Well, on it was on iTunes. It's if you actually look at there, it's still on iTunes. But because it was meant to be housed on some server, and then that server's died, it's not there. So you, it's there, but you can't. Oh, listen you can't to listen it, to it. Which it. sucks because it was really good. <laughs> How had you but even was, heard of podcasts well, at that point? Did you so call it a podcast? Very, very, yeah, it was a pod. It was back. There were podcasts. Ah. we had this um, aim to be like, like on the top philosophical b- podcasts or something if you took it that we'd be there and obviously well, you'll we probably did two the episodes top, and you're probably the top because they're probably only like one other one <laughs> yeah. like did you get podcasts. very philosophical in your early 20s no we were, no it was just like di- dissecting the world as according to us in our i don't know i probably would have been like i don't know early 30s i guess i was but so fun i know but i was ahead of the how Damn, but I, i'm genuinely yeah like posts? honestly you're like a, a huge futurist like how did you kind of know did you see them as trends coming up or it was just a bit of a coincidence well, you know what? it was actually my flatmate she was the one that started this is looks.blogspot.com and then um she was the one that initiated and it was funny because like our lo-fi podcast was like we recorded it on our macbook pro oh yeah and then it'd be like okay and action and then we'd go Beep, beep, beep. You know, when you put the, the volume up and it goes beep, 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 beep. And yeah. you could hear like the music, what, like we'd play some music and then beep, 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 put the music down and then we'd start talking. Oh, so that was, was your intro, yeah. outro kind of thing. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. It was very lo fi, but I wish I could find it somewhere. But anyway. Uh, so cool. you were a video editor. Yes. And then how did Spell then come about yeah. or find you? So. In 2009, I, no, in 2008, I broke up with my boyfriend or 
I broke up with him, but it was just a bad situation. And we um, moved away from each other. And I went into this sort of spiral, terrible time uh, of depression and heartbreak. And it was this really kind of cataclysmic kind of year for me. And it made me just question everything and how fulfilled I was in my life. And I looked at him. He was an actor. So he did, had this job that he was really passionate about and loved and would drop anything for. And I was like, I don't care about editing, like, at all like for me the thing that's passion i'm passionate about is my friends and my family and creativity but i didn't feel like i was getting any of that from my current career and um i did a little work, lot of work that year i did the artist's way and i did a self-development course and um actually all my friends paid for me to do to do a self-development course for oh my, my birthday goodness, that's so cool and that was sort of after you know being broken up for a year and me just falling into the depths of despair and they were all a bit worried about me um at that point were you could you see that like this wouldn't be forever like you knew that there was going to be a yeah. way out for you it was a really profound time for me i look back and it was actually one of the best years of my life it was just this questioning and reading and crying and journaling and growth and and you know i have, haven't probably looked in at myself as much in my whole life as i did that year yeah um and you couldn't stay in that place if you stayed in that place you'd become neurotic but i kind of worked through it and then at the end of it i did this course and kind of had this re- moment of clarity and rang spell up in byron who was she was already up there um making jewelry and selling jewelry at the markets and i asked her if she needed a business partner and she was like, oh my god i totally do and i booked we booked a trip to Bali that year, uh, sorry, that month, and I moved up to Byron the next month and we were in business together. And that was middle of 2009, so it was just after. So at that point, it, you mentioned she was selling at the Byron market. So, like, what does being a business partner to that look like? When you walk up and she's, like, when I went up there and she was already kind of doing her thing, yeah, I was a bit worried about that. I thought that maybe she might be like, because I've always been the older bossy sister. So yeah. that's been my like persona for my, the twin sisters were always like, oh, right, I roll, <laughs> Elizabeth, stop being so bossy. You're always so um, boisterous. I got called sometimes. And so I thought, oh, I'm, am I going to go up there and step on anyone's toes? But she was really open and she basically, I didn't buy into the business at all. She just, it was just like we were in business. Mm-hmm. And I think at one point she kind of went, okay, well, it cost me $500 to buy the tent and the FPOS machine or whatever and so let's just we'll just call it even and whatever and I just sort of started she taught me how to make jewelry so I was twisting the jewelry and making the jewelry Um, but then I also came up with all these skills that I hadn't really acknowledged before like photoshop and video editing and I was like everything we did I was filming it and taking photos of it with a professional camera and editing it and I was like okay well this website looks horrible so she'd already had some really basic website and so I redesigned the website and I was just living in Photoshop and, you know, oh, then this Pinterest thing launched and I was like, let's take photos for Pinterest and put it up there. And I love this brand Planet Blue and Free People in America. They do all these cool shoots. Oh, let's yeah. do something yeah. like that and let's take photos and do our own shoots and ask our friends. We had all these gorgeous friends in Byron and let's get them to just model for us. And we just started doing little shoots on our weekends. And um, the best thing was working at the market so that was like the funnest thing like sitting with our coffees on a Saturday Sunday morning it was super cold like this when I moved up in the middle of winter and you know you're like waiting for people to come to the stall and then you make a sale and it was just like oh my god totally so the best feeling do you oh ever miss god. those days I don't miss them because they're a lot of work Mm. especially the physical labor and setting up a market stall and our stall wasn't like a table and a tent it was like a table covered in like old curtains that we'd got from the op shop and then we'd pin the whole store up with pins like the sign was like this big canvas thing that we'd hand painted you know it was just this debacle it took about 90 minutes to set up yeah so it was so much work but it was probably one of the happiest times of the whole business was yeah. sitting there in the sun and you know the dude would come around take your coffee order and he'd bring your coffee and then oh and every time we made a sale it was just like the biggest endorphins rush yeah and I miss that when it was like you you sell a necklace and it was it was actually the best thing ever and I remember once going <laughs> into a Thai restaurant or um Asia Joe's in Oh, I love Asia Joe's. Yeah. I ate oh. it last night for dinner. Yeah. Oh, so I went to Asia Joe's and uh, one day I remember when I just started and like I ordered like, you know, whatever it was. And I looked at the guy who was taking my order and I looked at him and I just sort of looked at him like with this camaraderie of like 
working in a business and I said, isn't it just the best when you make a sale? <laughs> and he just looked at me like, who the fuck is this? And what are you talking about? He was obviously some backpacker. Yeah, he's like, really I don't care. own it. I don't care. I know. And I was shift. just like, oh. You know, like he must be so excited that I've come in and I've bought some food. <laughs> anyway, That's yeah. Amazing. How cool is that that you went from like this really tough year and, you know, you said you were like going through this like depression yeah. and then like next year you were just like sounded like totally high Euphoric. on life. I was. Yeah. It was. And, you know, having done the artist's way and been searching for this, um, you should, was that your phone? No, it was oh, okay. my computer. Was that your dog? No, no. <laughs> thank you. All good. Um, having... I'd been searching for this f- creative fulfillment. That was what I was looking for. And then all of a sudden, and, I, and back in Sydney, I remember going and hanging out at this um, jewelry shop in Double Bay, which sells like beautiful turquoise, like vintage jewelry. And I'd just go and hang out there and look at the jewelry and just yearn for it and love it. And I'd buy these rings that were like worth $2,000, but I'd put them on lay-by and pay off $20 a week. That's how much I wanted to be part of mm-hmm. this jewelry's life. And then I was up here and I was making my own jewellery and buying turquoise stones and doing it myself. And it was like all my dreams had come true. It was the best. So cool. Totally. So how did you kind of take it from that level to like just jewellery where now like looking at Spell, it's like an empire. (laughs) Um, Well, we started already, Spelly had already started, um, when I say Spelly, her name's Isabella, but when we were sisters and we'd scream to each other across the house it'd be like spa spa spelly ah. and that's how she became spell uh-huh. and, and was it through like had she named the business already when you got into it she had was calling it spell um but we thought we needed to change the name so we sat around in bali drinking our like cocktails trying to think of new names and we came up with so many names and i was dead set on changing the name because i thought mm, it's not a very good name um and then I came back to Byron because we went to Bali pretty much. The first, was the first thing we did. And then I moved to Byron. And once I got there, she actually had created something already that was a living, breathing thing. Like when yeah. we had the markets, I'm talking like there'd be 30 people at the market stall all like five or six people deep buying mm. stuff. Like it was crazy. And I was like, we can't change the name. Like people, this is already a thing here. Like, yeah. So we just left it. And are you the gypsy? Is that where oh that comes god. in? Oh my god, don't <laughs> even talk to me about the name of our business. <laughs> <laughs> it is a shit fight. It's like trademarking the word spell is a nightmare. So we can't bring it back to spell, but spell on the gypsy collective is like the longest name ever. Uh, um, and what about, you know, the word gypsy now? Is there like controversy around yeah, that word? Yeah, it's really hard. We don't really know what to do actually. And I would say that anyone who is starting a business to make sure that you think about trademarking issues very early on like don't just call your name something and then think five years down the track that you're going to be able to trademark it because you might find that someone else has already trademarked it or it's impossible to trade it because it's a too commonly used word Mm. um we had that exact same issue we wanted to call our brand two shoes yeah but steph's boyfriend is a lawyer and he was like you will never get that trademark so that's why we call that's why we made up a word tubes and that's awesome that you did that and i hope you trademarked it because it's a big deal (laughs) um we have the lawyer insisted on it (laughs) yeah yeah well we didn't even think about talking to a lawyer in those early days um and yeah basically it was like back in the early days it was 2009 and when you googled spell you'd get all these magic spells yeah and then if you wrote spell jewelry it said how do you spell jewelry in america oh, spell oh jewelry no. is this and in, Amer- in australia this is how you spell it and it's oh just a God, google that's nightmare so funny. and i was like okay we need to have something else it needs to be something else and i probably should have called it spell byron bay or i should have called it mm. anything else but hindsight's twenty twenty, right <sighs> yeah um and at the time we had this office that we'd sort of sublet to all these different artists and we were selling we had this little shop out the front and we sell all these different vintage stuff and art and our designs and it just I just kept thinking gypsy collective like it just felt like we're all little gypsies who'd floated into Byron and we were so floaty and happy and I loved the term gypsy it reminded me of Stevie Nicks and that Stevie Nicks song and I just kept thinking spell in the gypsy collective and it just kept rolling off my tongue and I couldn't think of anything else and I was like let's just call it that mm-hmm. And here we are today. Yeah. And it's, 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 you try and make a logo for Spell and the Gypsy Collective. It's the longest word ever. And then now also the kind of cultural appropriation or cultural element of Gypsy, which I had no idea that there was. And it's, people yeah, say it's, no, none you know, of us did in 2009. Yeah. No. And so, but people say you should change your name. But to change your name in an international business, 
would mean trademarking something else and you can't trademark and you can't spell. Trademark spell. We have tr- spell trademarked in Australia, but you can't in Europe or America. So mm. we're just in this really difficult transitional period where we're trying to work out what to do. Yeah. So okay. how international are you guys now? Um, well, I mean, every business is international now yeah. because you're selling online and anything Well, you when sell- you have all the celebrities wearing your clothes, <laughs> I think you're a bit more international. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, we have uh, agents in America, so probably America's the market that we've moved into the mo- with the most sort of energy. Um, but eventually we'd love to do more stuff in Europe as well and, and, and that's where it could become problematic with that name. So, so mm. speaking of this. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Speaking of celebrities, mm. we've seen you have a lot of incredible celebrities. Um, we love wearing, celebrities. We so do. When, we're, we're big so when on celebrities. celebrities are wearing Australian labels, we get very excited. We should have Mel here. Mel is my marketing manager and she loves celebrities as well. Oh, really? She can talk celebrities with the best of them. I'm not as great. I'm a little bit like, oh, I don't okay. really know who anyone well, We've is. got a little list here. We've got okay. Blake Lively, Kate Hudson, Chrissy Teigen. Yes. Come on. Vanessa Hudgens, who was one of the first celebs, yes. I think, to ask We love, up. yeah. How does that feel? Like when you see a celebrity wearing your pieces, is it still just like a rush or are you just not a celebrity person and you're like, I like anyone wearing my pieces? I, it's not really, I mean, look, I think from a business point of view, we probably get more traction when a blogger who really knows how to sell something wears something and it actually translates in sales. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so it's like, yes, oh my gosh, look, that person wore our dress and she made it look like that and you know that's amazing in terms of celebrities um i guess there's a the celebrities that you love that if you saw them wearing your stuff it would be such a rush because it's like i've loved you forever and yes. oh my god like all spelly wants to see is kate moss wearing one of her pieces and yeah. it's like kate moss is like a celebrity from like our generation so it wouldn't even matter to probably sales yeah, yeah. or anyone in this generation you yeah know? but just personally yeah that would for be her so it would cool. mean you know and so when we she saw like, it Kate Moss? She, uh, we did end up giving her a gift because she was here for a music festival once and we gave her a gift and her daughter wore uh, some of that stuff, which was pretty cool. That's that is close. Cool. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when Blake Lively wore something, it was like, she's a really stylish, beautiful, positive, amazing woman who I really look up to and it was beautiful to see her wearing our stuff. Yeah. And... Yeah, so I, I yeah, I'm so sure there'd be different people who I'd get super psyched on if they if they who's your ultimate? Like. <gasps> oh God, I don't even know. <laughs> I know I'm really terrible. You're like all the ultimates are wearing them yeah, right now. So. No, I, think, I mean Kate Hudson. Like, surely you go crazy over that? No. Y- yeah, I just I don't no. know. I just kind of you're not a celeb person. I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I am like. You know, like if someone from like the Vampire Diaries, I do, I like love the Vampire Diaries. So like that's up, like I'm kind of got okay. my own little things that are off in the distance. That yes. If, you know, like if Tori Amos, who me and my sister were ridiculous, psycho, stalky Tori Amos fans. And if Tori Amos wore us, that would be like this really beautiful nostalgic moment where I'd be like someone who we loved through our 20s and 30s. It was wearing spell. That would be like mind blowing. But yeah. yeah. That wouldn't mean anything to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so when, like in those initial stages, like before celebrities were wearing your clothes, I think like, yeah, we read Vanessa Hudgens was one of the first at Coachella. Like yeah. how does how does someone even go about getting their clothes on somebody like that? How did she, I don't even know how she got that. Maybe she got it. I actually can't remember how she got it, but I didn't know who Vanessa Hudgens was. Okay. But then. No I High had, School Musical? No, it's just a little bit. A, yeah, I know. Time. I, even I'm too yeah. old for it, but I love it I mean, anyway. I watch but it. once, like, it was a big deal when she wore that this red jumpsuit. Um, she might have just bought it. I can't remember, but oh, she wore better. it, and it, I could I could see what a big deal she was because it was like it sold out overnight. You know, yeah. it was crazy, and she wore it so amazingly as well. And since then, I kind of just adore her and think she's just like I've watched. I've kind of kept up with what she's doing. Her now. style is incredible, and she's just a really fierce woman. Like mm. she's very creative and you know she's done broadway and she's just yeah she's got a lot of great stuff going on so i've loved watching her yeah you know but it wasn't like i knew who she was at the time but then i was like oh yeah yeah okay so you guys run your business out of byron Mm -hmm. um and we are so lucky to be here for the uh, two days actually at the past yeah it was so beautiful (laughs) we did a lighthouse walk this morning and we were just like the whole way we were like 
people who live here are so lucky. Yeah, like we had set our alarm to like 8.30 before this interview. We were like, oh, we'll have a bit of a sleep in because we had a hectic week. And then we both woke up at like 7.15 and we are like, lighthouse walk. Oh my gosh. Such a great place. I mean, I used to live in Bondi and I used to do the Bondi to Bronte uh, walk and that is just as phenomenal. Oh, that's it is. spectacular. Yeah. When I'm there, I'm like, how am I in Australia? What's yeah. going on? I Why know, don't I, I live in Sydney? To live in Bondi or Byron, yeah. you are living. Yeah. So what is work life? We know you're on maternity yeah. leave right now, but so like back when you're like in the office. I'm still there quite a bit, but not <laughs> your of version of maternity. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm like not there anything compared to what I used to, but it's I'm still got my little fingers in a few different little pies. <laughs> yeah, okay. So what does like work life look like when you live in Byron? Make us jealous. Um, look, I think to be honest, the, the girls who work, for, I mean, for me and for the girls who work in my team, they are such hard workers. Like they work really, really hard and passionately all the time. And people often think, I think people are often, some people are quite surprised when they start working, how much we expect. Like yeah. we actually have a really high expectation of the performance that the people in our team can bring. Um, but there's a really great lifestyle that goes along with that in that they probably only leave five minutes from work. Yeah. So you're only spending five minutes in the car or 10 minutes maybe getting to work which allows a surf in the morning or a run or a walk or it allows you to have a beautiful morning and then um you know getting home so I think that there's that lifestyle that's on either side of the work that's really beautiful people can go for swims or rides even at, you could literally go at lunch in your lunch time, break yeah, yeah if you wanted to um we really celebrate that as well what we have early Fridays and everyone leaves at three o'clock on Friday and they get paid the full day um just so that they can go and spend a bit of time whether it's on wellness or getting something done and we kind of want to facilitate I guess a lot of people who have moved here to work for us we want to let them we want to celebrate that and let them kind of enjoy those special moments in Byron like oh, a Friday afternoon. I would move here to work for you guys this is <laughs> it's just like so magical here yeah and I feel like there's definitely something in that like in like your mental health is just feels better when you're like yeah. around the ocean and Byron in particular is just like such a magical place yeah it is it's 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 gotten a lot busier over the last 10 years and you know that's something that it's just comes up you know it's a really popular place to move and everyone's moving here and you know i feel i feel like oh i should have just kept it quiet like yeah, yeah. stop it's telling, telling you around. To work here. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah it's terrible byron's terrible yeah. don't come i mean look i think probably one of the the biggest things that i've always been such a huge advocate for here is that you can come and you can really create your own life and that's what I've always been really what I've loved about this town is when I moved here and there was that industrial estate and I would have never in a million years thought that we would be able to have a shop or an office space I always thought that you could only do that if you were like super successful or something but yeah at the time it's not possible now but at the time we got like you know we were paying I don't know it was 80 bucks a week for an office or whatever it was you know 200 bucks from per month you know and it was just so accessible and I couldn't believe that and that's what was really cool about it it's pretty cool also that like to think that this is just like a small chill town with like maybe not a lot of job opportunities mm. in the way that you guys are running your business now and you've been able to create that here like and living like a normal office life I guess which maybe didn't exist before there were lots of amazing creative businesses. They were sm definitely smaller, but there was lots of wonderful creative opportunities, I think. But since in the last 10 years, a lot more brands have moved here, um, which has made it a lot busier and a bit more hectic. But it's great to know that, we, like, you know, at, in our office, we have like 60 women working there. Yeah, and it's really that's cool incredible. To offer that in a regional area, you know. But and also that store that you mentioned, like, you know, everyone loves to talk about now how like physical retail stores are a thing of the past mm. how is it here having having that store um and it's not in like the heart of Byron Bay it's yeah. in the industrial it's area a, it's a destined oh is it in, no, no it's, oh, yeah, sorry, it's, it's it, you, we started out with our office and then a little store at the front in the industrial area and now the spell store is just sort of on the edge of town it's like oh is it not it's I thought I drove here. past it in the industrial area at the, moment, at the other day or is that your office that's the office oh yes. okay yeah so it's our a bit near top shop is it uh, it's right opposite where the green garage used to be. Yeah, yeah, the okay. Roundabout as you're coming into town. It's a real destination. Like you go to drive there. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the store, look, in terms of is retail dead, it's really hard to tell up here in Byron because it is such a little pocket of, you know, I mean, even I, when I was living in Sydney, I'd come to Byron and I'd shop 
that's what I would do. I would come here and I would be on holiday. I never had time to shop in my normal life. So I'd come up here and I'd, I'd get into my beautiful escapist, free spirit personality and I'd buy the beautiful long dress and I'd, I'd buy all that beautiful stuff. that I'd, The crystals. You know, in Sydney, I'd buy a pair of Subi jeans and a white mm. T-shirt and maybe a nice knit and that's what I'd do. Yeah. And that's what I'd live in and then I'd come up here and I'd shop all the beautiful things that I never would shop in Sydney. And so it's hard to tell whether or not – because for us, the shop's very successful up here and really um, financially viable – I don't know how we'd go in Sydney. I don't know where we've got our eye on maybe opening a store possibly in Venice. We did a pop up last year and that that's went really well. That's a great idea. Oh, that's such a good idea. That would bit. be so cool. Yes. We love the idea of having stores like the the idea of having a store like in the city where I live is just like the funnest thing ever. But yeah, like we're always kind of going back and forth between like, We've is that where we same. should invest our yeah. energy? Is oh, it not? It's so hard, especially when you've got an online, you know, that direct to consumer online presence, the amount of money and energy you have to invest in a physical place, a physical bricks and mortar store is, is just crazy. And you have to really see it's not about, it's not, about almost financial return it has to be about something beyond that Mm -hmm. it has to be about a brand experience you have a moment to kind of really say to people this is the physical experience of spell or whatever brand it is well and i think that's why your store is so Mm. good like that's what i love about a store and that you've Mm. done it so well you walk in and you instantly are immersed in like the brand lifestyle and like you're like oh okay these clothes go with this which i understand and i can kind of like see the bigger picture of what they're creating here yeah. It's like your own little spell world. Yeah, and that's and you know having the Airbnb attached to that, and then you have an Airbnb attached to it. Yeah, there's like an Airbnb above it. No, and then there's way. like a spell kind of. Well, it's like not a themed. spell Airbnb. It's just, it's just, it is. I guess it is. We, did, it's yeah. It's so like when a, you book it on Airbnb, can you tell that it's spell? No. Oh, oh you should brand a, it. That's yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Called the cactus. Cactus rose. That's up. so yeah. cool. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that idea. But um, so there's that, and then there's the courtyard at the side, which we have lots of events, and we're able to kind of do lots of activations in our courtyard. And that's what we love about it. It's not just a little store; it's got all these other elements around it that weave into the lifestyle of it. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, and that's what we'd want if we were going to open one somewhere else. But yeah, I'm fascinated by the whole conversation about bricks and mortar versus digital and online. And you know, on one hand, you have so many brands saying they started online and they're all starting to open up stores. Like you look at someone like Reformation who are like growing so amazingly in America and they're opening up stores here and here and here and there must be something to that. Yeah. Having that physical experience really does extend the customer's experience. Well, we recently went to um, at Melbourne Fashion Festival. We were in a round table with a bunch of other brands and we were really surprised that a lot of them have physical stores. Like there was Bull, there was Vic and Woods, is it obviously like much more established. Um, can you remember who else there was? Uh, Dita on Chapel Street. Yeah. And, and and pretty much everyone sitting around the table had a bricks and mortar store, mm. at least one that did really well for them. Yeah. And I was really surprised by that. And for us being shoes, there's definitely something in that, like people want to try them on. Yeah. 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 So yeah. we kind of left that and we were like, oh, okay. Like, you Maybe. know, because you hear so much about. We yeah. love a pop up. Yeah. Like that, well, we I mean, always usually do a pop up like for a couple of months around Christmas. Yeah. But yeah, like the idea of a physical store, mm, I just love it. I think so many people are using pop ups to kind of be able to achieve what you want to achieve for an online store, but not sign a five year lease. It's going to yes. sort of, you know, it's so hard to know where to go. And I mean, myself, I don't go anywhere to shop. I, I just shop online, and I don't, I don't shop physical anywhere. Yeah. I love physical shopping. Like Steph loves shopping. I online. love the online as well. I am obsessed yeah. with physical shopping. But like even now in Melbourne, like I don't know when the last time you went there is. But How far would you travel for a physical shopping experience though? Or would you just if go to If I one? knew I was going to find something great, far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would. So you talked about, um, you know, like digital is obviously really big for you mm-hmm. guys. Um, and we read about how social media was like a really big part of how you grew your business. Is that still a really big part of it for you now? Yeah. Um, look, definitely social media allowed us to start a business with zero capital, um, zero minus zero capital. Um, and so we were able to 
just market our business to our customers and have that conversation, develop really strong relationships with our community through those platforms, whether that was, look, let's face it, mostly Instagram. I've never really been a Facebook person, although I know it's it's very successful for us, but it's not usually me on there massaging that. Um, whereas Instagram, I'm still like so particular about everything mm. um, and it's my baby. But um, it's been really important for us to diversify that as well. I think obviously the algorithms on Instagram have made it that you can't just rely on that anymore. Um, and I mean, obviously that happened first with Facebook where it used to be that everything you posted, everyone saw. And now when you post it, you either can pay for it or, you know, which I understand and people complain about it. I find that so strange. Like I would never expect Mary Claire to run an ad for me for free. Yeah. So I think why would like, Facebook run an ad for me for free? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's a you know. shift in mentality, exactly. I think, from like being a user that can use a platform for free mm. than to being a brand that is selling something on yes. the platform because yeah. there was this little window where people got it for free and brands like triangle you know completely exploded all oh. over using that free advertising and then people were like oh cool i can do this too and then facebook quickly was like nah now you gotta pay well it wasn't that i mean facebook were like let's just say let them see the power of our platform. yeah yeah it was let's clever get let's get them in it's amazing. It's yeah, like it's Uber Eats. The goal. <laughs> you remember Uber Eats used to be free in the beginning, like oh, free delivery. Yeah, that was free delivery. We Ooh. don't have Uber. Oh, I think we've just got Uber Eats here. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh. When they launch, I think like when they launch in a new city, they do like a, a free like few months or something. Yeah. So you all get hooked. Yeah. Everyone and then... talks. I think it was 2013, but it was there was this golden year of Facebook where you just you threw a dollar in and hundred dollars came back. It was crazy. Yeah. Just the amount of people, and then they obviously went okay, and now doors shut now it you know and they and that's obviously what instagram's doing i find it weird because personally when i'm on my feed and i see a sponsored post i'm just like get out of my face like i don't i don't respond uh, to i do i'm like oh yeah, my god facebook me. knows me so well <laughs> i love that i love that i love that <laughs> look i must admit i have clicked through to a few things if it if it does know you well and it shows you something that you really want to see then i guess that's cool and it's yeah i actually appreciate it because yeah. like i'm always on the lookout for a new brand that i haven't heard of yeah. and that's what they show me yeah. but i think for you guys like you do imagery so well and that's such an important part of it that i think like some small brands are just like oh just like take a photo of my product, slap it up there, that'll yeah. sell. But for you, you know, you look on your Instagram and you just like get a sense of the brand instantly. Yeah. I mean, it's something that's always been at the heart of our brand was that storytelling element. And that was me coming in from a video editing place. And even before that, when I grew up, it was all about visual diaries. So like we kept a visual diary from when we were so young and we've got, we've got our life book. I've still got my life book and every year we'd go in and we'd like create this collage of our life and then there'd be like each year we'd have a different visual diary and every time we went on a holiday we'd make a visual diary of that holiday and my kids are doing that now. So I, I, That we, sounds amazing. I don't and, have you know, a life book. They've got Polaroids and they take photos and they collect leaves when we go camping and stick them in and make, you know, it's I'm teaching them to create that visual storytelling element hopefully that they can have that rather than learning it to do it on Instagram because I felt like people talk you know I have even heard you guys talk about that kind of highlights reel that mm -hmm. Instagram has become but for me it's just been my visual diary but in digital form and that was how I told stories was the beautiful things around me that inspire me go into my diary but now they go on Instagram as well so do you so, still keep like a physical visual diary um when I travel I do yeah, but I really do it with the kids now, I guess. Yeah. Like, yeah, but I kind of have driven that. Like, I'll make sure I've got a diary every time we go on a holiday. We've got a beautiful book that we can then start to collect little bits and pieces and um, take photos. And even if we're taking photos with a camera or on our phone, when we're on holiday, we'll stop it, like, in America, we'll stop it, like, the Kmart or the Walmart and get our photos developed so that the kids have got them in the pocket in the back of their visual diary that they can constantly be collaging you know like when we're on holiday when we're, okay we're at a hot hotel sit down with your diaries you can do some collaging and they'll be cutting and sticking and that's, that's yeah. such a great idea isn't it yeah. that's so nice I so that for that. me is what instagram is yeah it's just you know so for me i wouldn't put a boring picture in my diary or like a family photo album my parents were my my parents were photographers and they had a, a like a dark room in our bathroom so we grew cool. up with our parents like constantly developing photos in the dark room and they wouldn't have put a boring picture in our in our family photo album. It was always, you know, the best moment or the holiday or something interesting that happened. And so I kind of get that 
highlights reel element of Instagram that, and yeah. I don't see it as like, cu- it's curated, but it's, that's what you do with a photo album, right? It's yes. a curated collection of memories. That is completely what you do. And I guess that's why it's kind of gone in the direction that it has, yeah. but then it's like then taken one step too far yes. when it's like infiltrating everybody's brains that, yeah. oh, this is, the glossy well, way that everyone but also lives the bullshit. and I don't like feel like people that. go to a cafe, their kids crying, they spill a milkshake, they manage to take a nice photo and then they post a picture saying, morning at cafes. Exactly. But really it's a horrible morning. And that, yeah. that, that's the element that's yeah. kind well, of because, taken it to that. Ugh. And you're doing the visual diary for yourself. You're not yeah. doing it to show everyone mm. and be like, look how good mm. my life is. Yeah. You're doing it for yourself and so you can kind of see your memories there in a book. And I guess yeah. that's where social media has this disconnect because suddenly it's like, we all have access to it and millions of people looking at everyone else and going, yeah. ah, my visual diary doesn't look as good as everybody <laughs> else's visual diary. Yeah. Yesterday yeah. when we were at, like we were at this conference, Retail Global, and they were, um, we saw this video and it said, it was talking about how people want to experience things. And then it like touched on the fact that if they didn't share it, then it's like the experience didn't exist. And that just like struck a chord in me where I was just like, oh, that's so like, no, I don't want that to be what it's it so, is. It's so true and it's so weird though, isn't it? I remember on because on the weekend my I've been I decided to take all my kids off my personal Instagram mm-hmm. just because I thought I would. I, I just archived all the photos of my kids that I, you know. And um I just decided and I could retract this at any point, but I decided that I didn't want to sort of use my kids anymore, you know, on my personal life. I could keep it more to work or, you know, locations or whatever. And then my husband went camping on the weekend with my two kids and he was sending me photos. And in the past, I would have posted a photo of them camping because it's cool and they're off and they're camping and there's my son's surfing and they've got photos of their cool tent. And I would have put it up there and it would have been great. But I was like, I was really um, torn torn about, am I doing this just to say to everyone, suck, sucked in, my husband's <laughs> taking my kids camping <laughs> and it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I just didn't do it. But then it was like, no one knows we went camping yeah totally and there's nothing wrong with sharing it because i think like just as humans like we want to share when we find something cool we want to share it with people and there's just like that it's just the fact that you're aware of it and you're not going to be just doing it to be like look at me you know it's okay you don't have to feel guilty about wanting to share great moments that you had i think i i think i always just asked i what i try and do now is i think would this make anyone who isn't here feel left out like if yeah. there's like if I'm with a bunch of friends and we're doing something that's really cool, like we're having a fire at their house and we're all make, toasting marshmallows. In the past, I would have po- posted that, but now I'm like, I've got friends who aren't there. That would kind of be shit for them to see that. That's so a that's great just like way it of looking and, you know, at it. it. Doesn't that's yeah. That's anyway, it's it's a whole it's a whole thing now, yeah, right? It's it a, whole a whole new thing. thing. Well, yeah. it's good that we're talking about yeah. it at least, you know. Yeah, I think exactly. a lot of people are talking about it lately. They it's, are. It yeah. feels like it's definitely coming to the zeitgeist. There's a There's change new, in tide yeah. for sure. Tide. Yeah. Uh, so you have a tab on your website called People and Planet <gasps> that we wanted oh, to talk I to you so about. I'm excited talking about all this stuff. Oh my god! Uh. Can I tell you? We, so we've been looking. We've been trying to be really transparent about our supply chain. We have nothing to hide and. You know, we're trying to make all of our practices more sustainable. Our shoe label is animal friendly, which was like the number one for us. But now we're like, what else can we be doing? And so we sent um, a girl in the office to like do some research on what else is out there. What are other people doing? And when we looked on the Spell website, it was like, oh, this is a great page. And then I was like, wait, there's another page. Wait, there's another page. And (laughs) and it just goes and goes. And and it's like getting lost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you call it a journey that you can go on. And that's just so incredible. We want to hear all about Um, that. It was so, it's it's so, when I say I've still got my feet, like to me, that's the part I haven't really taken a leave from at all, even though I'm on maternity leave. It's the part that I just can't let go of because it's so important. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, that is the drive for me at the moment I, I've kind of been thinking it's funny because I've done other podcasts before or interviews a lot of magazine interviews and I find that when a founder gets sick of their own founder story it's time to fucking shake it up and do something else and create a new story for your brand and I think there's only so long you can go we started at the market mm. yeah and Instagram was really cool and then it's like okay <sighs> You yeah what's, about next? That. what's next yeah, yeah. And we yeah. like what's, to ask yeah. people about that to give the, the interview context but, but we're always so yeah. conscious yeah. of like yeah let's talk about something yeah. new and fun and fresh yeah well or just even 
you know, when you're telling it yourself and you feel like surely no one else wants it, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so we this, found it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if, if you've yeah. never heard it before, of course, it's not of course. boring. Yes. No. Um, but it has for me been really, I guess, having been in the business with Spell for 10 years, it's the next phase of my evolution as a businesswoman. And I think that when I started working with Spell, um, it wasn't the fashion that I got so psyched on. It was the entrepreneurial journey. That's what, for me, just tapped into something else. I didn't know what really an entrepreneur was. I thought it was like a businessman or something. But it's like all of a sudden this desire to sell and market and tell story, that was all the part that just went, rah, this is amazing. And that's what this new sustainability journey has tapped into for me. It's actually, it's really interesting to, to, to observe how the sustainability journey actually can be part of the entrepreneurial journey and has the same motivators behind it. Because when you're an entrepreneur, you want to refine, you want to get better, you want to grow, you want to constantly evolve. That's what business is about. And that's what, that for me, is what sustainability is about. It's about, okay, we've got this business. It does X, Y, Z. We turn over X, Y, Z. Now, what's next? Mm. How can we make this better? And you can make it better by just growing more money and just increasing your turnover. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, we made an extra million. Like, that's good. You've got to have money to be able to do the thing to care about to, yeah you've got to, to keep a sustainable business you have like as in financially sustainable you need to continue to have a turnover but if that's all your drive is you're going to get bored and i think i would have had to move on to a new brand or try something or build something new had i not have found this new sustainability journey that we're on and so that's um what you can see kind of coming to life in those people and planet pages because um yeah, that's, it's just this whole new part of the business which is flourishing and everyone in our business is so excited about it. So it so started like four or five years ago, right? Yes. Yep. And at that point had more sustainability... Three or four years ago. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, three or four years ago. Yeah. And at that point had sustainability just not been a part of the business. And then how do you even begin yeah, that? You know, it's yeah. such a huge... Well, I mean, one when I... Ba- okay, so basically... Our business started quite sustainably because we were so small and grassroots. So we were hand making jewelry from literally found objects uh, mm. at the very beginning, and then we started, you know, in moving into silver and gold and other things, and then started making clothes in Bali at a really small. Our first production house was a woman who's the same age as me, and three seamstresses. Actually, seam guys. They were men on sewing machines same guys same guys (laughs) (laughs) and there were three guys and we'd just sit there and we'd all just hang out the guys would smoke and we'd have to make them put cigarettes out and it was all just like super cruisy and we hang out with them we had dinner with them um little sugang was the pattern maker he was gorgeous and it was just this really simple small operation and our first order was like 25 dresses so that that's where it started and that is completely sustainable because it's just you know but then as we grew um we started looking okay so basically how i started down this journey was during fashion revolution week about four years ago um a customer asked us who made our who made my clothes so you, you guys know about fashion revolution week mm-hmm. i yeah. spoke to claire press a few weeks ago um and i was able to kind of be really proud and tell them where they were made and how we go to our factories all the time and we spend lots of time there um but it, as i was sort of going through that process of answering that question I kind of was like, well, how do they know we're telling the truth? And how do they know that, I don't know, I just felt like we were kind of just saying, we have a code of conduct and trust us, it's all good. Yeah. And, and it was, but how do they, it just, I just, it's just it was, like, just the first step. Yeah. But and I didn't so know much about more. accreditation or like verification or any of that stuff. And I, that's when I started to literally Google like sustainable fashion. Like, how do you, how do you, and, it, and that's when I started finding out about RAP or SEDEX or um, GOTS and all these different accreditation. What, what are all those words? So set, they're just different verification processes basically or different auditing bodies mm-hmm. that can basically go into your factory and they go through a checklist and they check off that all of these things are being adhered to. Cool. That you're saying to you. Most businesses will have a code of conduct that they have with their factories and they're really important because it tells your factory what's important to you. But whether or not that factory is adhering to that, you can't really be sure. Yeah. Even if you go there and it feels good, you can't be sure. And to be honest, the factories that we partnered with, we were very lucky because when we went and got third-party accreditation for all of our factories, there weren't that many things that had to be changed. They were really 
already operating really to a really high standard because we'd look for very specific value driven partnerships yeah so that was great but once you start talking about the social aspect the people and um the people who are working at that factory you can't then look away from basically that's so intrinsically linked to the environmental impacts as well Mm -hmm. whether or not i mean you know an example of that is with cotton for instance where people might for people to be being treated well when they're making when they're producing cotton they can't be using chemicals that yeah. harm them the communities and the pl- and, and the earth that they're using and um so all of a sudden i started learning more about the environmental side and i was starting to listen to podcasts and research and blogs and books and everything kept coming back that it was not just people it was planet as well and that's where we really started to and i mean back to that beginning where i saw podcast like podcasts and blogs and having that little bit of a vision and being such an early adopter on social media i had that i just knew four years ago that the sustainability thing was going to become really important and it wasn't just going to be a let's do this because our customers are asking a few customers are asking for it it was like i think it's going to get to the point that you're not going to be able to run a business if you can't if you can't back yourself and be accountable for the way you're running your business yeah and it feels like that's the direction that it's going 100 percent. Mm. like even when we look at our practices like it's funny because transparency like i totally understand that i like fully recognize that it's the first step into becoming kind of more environmentally friendly but like when i really sit there and think about it i'm like it's not good enough like mm. we you know not just transparency like we need to be pushing for this we need to be researching for that mm. and like we're we're also just kind of like beginning this journey of like yeah as Steph said like animal friendly was our number one but now like what else can we be doing um and it's super hard like and it's easy to take the easy way out of oh I'm just going to turn a blind eye I'm not going to do mm. anything but then what, but st- what are we all here for and I think seeing you guys do it has been really inspiring for us and it's really cool that you can have that impact and lead the way for other brands to do it as well it's funny because when i remember when we were at the very beginning of our business we just started to kind of make a little bit of a profit or at least be able to pay ourselves some money and we weren't really sure what to do or what we were supposed to be doing and oh gosh if we're making money we should be probably paying some tax what are we going to do and the first thing we did was we go and spoke to an accountant and then and she advised a bookkeeper and there was someone to go and speak to about that Mm. whereas five years ago you couldn't i didn't sustain you 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 wouldn't say okay so where's our our social responsibility consultant Mm -hmm. oh yeah look it up in the yellow pages that there's no that wasn't a job and it wasn't something that a business had to invest in yeah whereas now you could actually go and get a sustainability consultant they're still rare and they're still specialized but i'm hoping that anyone who's starting a brand will have the foresight that we didn't have which is to ask for that third party help that we now we now have a sustainability consultant that we can ask and we can ring up and say like this is a factory that we're thinking of working with and he can help us and like I don't know it just it's like you said it's really hard because we didn't know what we were doing and we were literally googling how to be a sustainable business at the beginning yeah same Uh, yeah (laughs) and I also (laughs) think like just with brands that are kind of leading the way like spell like it's amazing that you're able to like share all of that on your website and everything because yeah I mean like it rather than I guess it's like that old school looking like everyone's a competitor it's like no in this instance like we're not competitors we're all we should all be working together to share that knowledge and kind of move towards a more positive future for everybody that's definitely been that was probably one of the driving forces of when we when we kind of went okay this is going to be a thing and we're going to take this on and at first we were super scared we were like if we start to if we were if we mention the word factory to our customers oh, yes. yeah or china oh yeah like, we felt the same you know oh my god like what if they like it's ugly it's factories are ugly yeah yeah you it's know not they glamorous don't have, yeah. like a caftan oh my god there's not like reclaimed wood beams at the you know whatever it's yeah. it's it's what how are we gonna how are we gonna tell this story and should we and what happens if we do and are we gonna open a can of worms and um we just thought let's just just go the whole hog if we're gonna do this let's just open it up let's really tell the story and we'll use the way that we tell story which is with beauty and ins- you know inspiration to tell that story and and I, I did the same thing I went around and looked at a whole bunch of other websites to see what people were doing and at the time not 
they weren't doing that much but a few people stood out a, stu- a few other brands stood out at sort of doing a good job at telling that story and I was really inspired by that and um, it's been probably one of the best parts of it is to c- create a journey that people can learn from because because we're kind of learning as we go as well we've only just just this last month hired our first like f- like a proper sustainability person on our team cool. and um, even she's teaching us so much it's it's incredible but um yeah it's a journey and constantly learning ourselves well, <laughs> well we I definitely to Claire Press all the time oh we yeah she's podcasts. incredible she's so great. And, the, and the fact that like you know so many people have access to everything that she talks about just by following mm. her on social media mm. is amazing and yeah we definitely encourage people to go on the spell website and check out that people mm. and planet tab and oh, go on the you. journey yeah for sure so should we head into some quick fires before yeah. we wrap up you oh, have gosh. a facial to get to I do. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna go to brunch at bayleaf which i'm so yeah. excited I'm about so excited <laughs> really and i'm gonna call for an update on panther because hopefully he's feeling a little Aww. bit better oh yeah. yeah um so as you would know because you listen to our podcast yeah. or you've listened to a few um we end everything on we end all our episodes on a, some quick fire questions um, so we'll just throw them at you, okay. shall we? So speaking of cafes, what is your favourite cafe environment? Oh my god, I'm so bad at quick fire. Um, <laughs> favourite cafe? Um, look, Sparrow is. It's not a cafe, but it's like a hole in the wall. But it's where everyone gets their coffee here. Where is that again? Um, it's right near Aldi. I think it's Byron Street. I don't know. Oh, but yes, anyway, yes, they yes. make the best coffee. They really do. Um, but cafe. <gasps> I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, Sparrow was a good answer. Sparrow is my favorite it. coffee. It just is. Okay, okay, amazing. Yeah, I think I know it. And I, do they? I like. I assume in Byron you cannot get a disposable cup. Sure. You can get. You can get really? one, but you looked at very like. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. And they have a box of cups that you can just get a normal. They have cups there that you can use because it's just a takeaway place. Okay, because you yeah. showed up with your own coffee in your own I, mug this morning, which I, I just loved. I felt like that was so Byron. I have not used a coffee cup for over a year like I refuse even if I'm at the airport I'll just drink a coffee in a cup and then just leave yeah, yeah that's, that's amazing great. we interviewed Abigail Forsyth who's the founder of yes, Cape Cup recently uh, yes. amazing just like really cool yeah that that's same with plastic bottles I just draw a line I'm like yeah, I will go thirsty and I will get parched and sick and keel over before I buy a plastic mm. bottle it's Pla- terrible plastic bottles is such an easy one to get rid of yeah. like but you can just... I tell you on planes they still hand one out to every single person I yeah think, I think that's changing didn't Virgin or Qantas You'd or hope someone so. I think Qantas someone should change all they need is one person to change yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone will and then the other day I stayed at a hotel and it was a really nice oh. hotel and they gave everyone plastic bottles like all the time and I was like you could just give everybody like a branded flask or thermos when they arrive and then everyone's going to be walking around with your branding and take it home with them and just have water stations or even just, or even just a, a glass yeah just give us a glass yeah, yeah. these exactly. days I think yeah. people are all they're expecting um we had um we in our office you, you can't walk in with a plastic bottle there's no coffee cups no plastic bottles no plastic straws or plastic bags and we had a shoot there one day and the, the like the, the the shoot team that what do you call it the, the crew the crew rocked up with plastic bottles and everyone in our office just was freaking out Aww. and you can just see everyone's eyes just like look, everyone was looking around it was really nervous it was like that's so cool really that's where it your office really is really big though. deal yeah. But yeah that is cool when we were in bali the, on the first day like our villa said to us like we don't allow any plastic bottles plastic bags yeah. whatever while you're here which i thought was so great and a couple of the girls were like i have a plastic bottle <laughs> they were like uh oh they also said no me. wine and my housemate was like I've got wine <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, are there any other sustainable labels that you love um, there are a lot um, but I don't really buy clothes myself but I'm loving what Reformation are doing I think they do really well I like how they have an impact report and they can, they're kind of measuring their emissions and their water usage mm, and you can great. sort of see that when you're buying the actual um, style like I think that's really cool it's something that we haven't quite done yet um, sustainable label Arnsdorf also I don't know if you've seen they've had like a revamp it's Arnsdorf right yeah yeah I don't know they've had I think they even went out of business for a while and then she started it up again it's a Melbourne based label um and they just got complete transparency now they write on the website like how much they've um like how much do they know how much they make it for yeah Yeah, all the costs are really transparent that's like do that radical transparency where they actually say this is how much it costs us to make it this is how much we're selling it to you for and yeah 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 
that, that kind of works i think when you don't have wholesale it makes it a lot easier because you can kind of True. Yeah, true. The margins true, true, true. are a little bit well, more palatable. I think it's hard as well because in that instance, like they don't say to you and like, this is how much wages we pay to our staff. This is how much we pay for rent. And that's when it gets like a bit funny because it's like, it looks like a big markup, but it's like, it costs so much more to run a than just yeah. to pay for that garment yeah. because you also, yeah, you're running yeah. a business. I kind of find the radical transparency around the cost a little bit redundant. I'm kind of like, Clearly, to run a business, that like, this keep cup might cost me thirty dollars. It might cost the person who made it four dollars. But I get that he needs to run a business and yeah. pay his staff or Make some money. Yeah, rent yeah, exactly. the place or buy the clay or you know. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, all the things. So, what app do you spend the most time on? Probably Instagram and also the editing apps. Awesome. Okay, thank you cool. so we'll much. Facial, yeah. but thanks so much for chatting to us. See you guys.